is going to cut out the rib of it and take out all of the teeth. Now, for the purpose of this demonstration, we're not going to actually cook, but we're going to show you how to cook it because they're actually cooking in the oven. And you clean out the pepper, then you would get a little olive oil, put it in the pan, put the onions. Some people like celery or fennel, either one is good. So I'm using celery today. You would let that heat up, you know, your little pie, you mix it up, it's getting hot and it's good. And you add some garlic. Minced garlic is fine. You can mix it yourself or you can buy it already mixed. Either one will do serve the purpose for this recipe. You get your oregano, you mix it up. Uh, a little bit of red pepper. And you let that cook down. And then you would add your meat. So it can be ground beef, it can be ground turkey, it can be sausage, it can be ground chicken, whichever meat you prefer. You would put that in there. Would you grandma to make this for any special occasions? And maybe when I, when I was sad. Oh, really? Yeah. So this is comfort food for me. Yes. You can put anything in the soft pepper you like. So if, if you're plant based, what other things can you put in there? Rice, quinoa. But they would have to be cooked before you put it in the pepper. So whatever you're going to put in the pepper, it has to be cooked before you put it in the pepper. All right. So this would be. Then we add a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Mix that up. So if we use the fake ground meat that, you know, it's not meat, we have to cook it first? Yes, everything has to be cooked. Even even if it's the, even if it's the fake ground beef or something. What do you mean like beef? So, so if you're, yeah, if you're doing a fake beef, like a, 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 you know, Beyond Burger or something, does that have? Oh, no, 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 no. So that's already cooked. Yeah. Okay, so what does it have? That's very good. So you put the meat and now the meat is cooking. It's not cooked, so you don't have to. You don't have to cook the beyond beef. No, first. you have to cook the the, the, the meat. The meat you have to cook. And the rice, you oh. have to cook the rice. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, so I just so you do have to cook the beyond beef. Yeah, the beyond beef because otherwise it's it's a raw material and you can't. Yeah, it's oh, in the packaging. You're supposed to cook it. Yeah, you have to cook everything before you stuff the pepper. So then you would add the rice, you would take the meat off the fire, and then you would add the rice. Set up, set up. And Kevin, can you give me the container that has the cooked um, ingredients in it already so I can show what it looks like? Mix it up, mix it up, mix it up. And also, you can add a little bit of white wine if you prefer. Oh, that's it. Just a little. <laughs> don't get too uh, yeah. Well, the, the alcohol will cook out. It's more flavor. Okay. Then you will let this cool off. Okay. Spoon or a spatula. So this is what it looks like when it's cooked. Oh, we have, I forgot. We have to add the tomato. Diced tomato, any flavor you like. They have some of garlic, they have fire roasted, whatever you prefer. That's the tomato. Mix that all the way up. So it looks like this once it's done and ready to be put into the pepper. So that cool off, and you have your pepper right here already opened and caved out. Take a spoon and you can just pack it on in there. So you leave the stem on? If you like it, it's just, it's just for pretty, you know, you don't leave it. Just and how much do you pack in there? Just so, to make sure it's stuffed. Stuff it. <laughs> so, 
It can actually be like pulling out. And then we put it in with a little bit of white wine in the bottom of the pan, just so we can absorb into the pepper to give you that flavor. And you would top it with the mozzarella cheese. Oh, wow. And then you bake it in the oven for maybe 30 minutes or so. At what temperature? 350 for 35 minutes or so. And Kevin is going to come. Well, we have about a time. Five minutes. Want to eat here? You want to go on? Because if we have shit. Yeah. Oh, she Come on, come on, come on. Don't be shy. My trusty Don't self. be shy. Thank you, Mardine, for coming in. Mardine is here. She is our fabulous uh, dietitian who comes, and she and Tamika are teaming together today. Right. Um, so Tamika is doing the cooking, but Mardine can answer any and all uh, questions about nutrition, and she's got a bunch of fun facts that she so, wanted to share with you. So Mardine, you're going to be part of this. I'm going to hand you. Okay, go ahead. T Tamika, you have a question? Enough duck pepper to six to eight serves. So this makes six to eight. So it would be six to eight of these. So but you can scale it down from one or two, like I did. Scale it down. Okay, come on, here. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Well, uh, I can be in between. We'll, we'll take that. You'll we'll, we'll take turns. Okay, we'll I'm gonna go get three. Take your. Then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna make a salad. Okay. Yeah. So a serving of half of the pepper? Yes. So six to eight. So if you have four peppers, you have eight. Yeah. So, or if it was me, that's only one serving and the rest of you are one. I'll be right back. So I was, I wanted to do the color commentating. So I have a fantasy that one day I will talk to a sports event on first. Or what ball is bouncing across what kind of field? So here's, I thought it'd be interesting if we talked about some of the ingredients, some of their history, their biology. Um, and I found some things interesting in here too. At first I thought I would have, I would be the only one holding these pages. And then I was gonna do a few, guess which one is true, true or false. But now that we all have them, it's actually a little more fun. Um, starting with the peppers. As you can see here, peppers are, and when I did a, what do you need to stand behind the table? So I just see you. So recently I did the 10 nutritious ways to enjoy summer, which only wound up being five nutritious ways, but I gave you five good cartoons. And one of the, and one of the sources from that talk was a site called seasonalfoodguide.org, where I simply tapped in New York State and the month that we're in July. But I went back to that site and got some more juicy tidbits about different foods. So the first ingredient in Tamika's delicious um, menu today is the red, is the pepper. So you'll see that's the first one on my group. Curious that it's dated back from at least 3,500 before Common Era. By the way, this has nothing to do with nutrition, but we all grew up in public school, private school, where we had BC, which was before Christ. But you're, you're aware that that terminology is long since space. So it's BCE. And that gives us 5,000 or so more years that this pepper has been in human consumption not just for food, but also for medicine. And then the variety of peppers that can be so very, very hot. So there's a point down here describing how in 1912, Wilbur Scoville, who had to have been a masochist, okay, developed what would have become the Scoville scale. Has anyone watched any of those contests where people eat the peppers until they can't take it anymore? I can't even watch to the end of the show. Um, my eyes are running already. So there's a scale of how hot something will be. These are, of course, are very mild. And essentially the yellow and the green and the, the red are all, all the same pepper, but they have slight, been slightly um, 
selected in their breeding so that the color comes out. The brighter the color, the more been able to ripen on the vine and the sweeter it'll be. Okay, some evidence that the Mayans use chili as a remedy for various bacterial infections. I totally believe that. If I was bacteria, I'd be scared of the closest thing that looked like a pepper. Um, so noting here that a scorpion pepper usurped the Naga root Jolikaya. Anyone want to help me pronounce that word? Either way, the ghost pepper is never going to be on my grocery list. I, I think I expect that it will eat through um, most countertops moving right along. So another ingredient in today's representation, uh, today's recipe, pardon me, is olive oil. Mm -hmm. So I was one to admit that I did not grow up eating olive oil. Um, so I didn't develop a taste for it or an appreciation for it until way into my adulthood. And one of the points in here that I was surprised to learn, and I will ask those of you who haven't read through, what country do you think produces the most olive oil in the world? And we think of olive oil from a lot of different places. You think Greece? You think Greece? You say Spain? Not Italy. Not Italy, not Israel. Not Israel. Turkey. It's not Cal. It's, it's Spain. Okay, according to our references here. Um, also, one of the oldest known items consumed by humans in old Egyptian, well, I guess there's no such thing as a new Egyptian uh, pyramid. And some of the, the early discoveries, they found shards of um, plaster, not plaster, um, if you have an urn and it has a, a sign on it, price of olive oil from the Egyptian tombs of, again, at least 3,500 BCE. So we know olive oil has been around a long time. Why do we praise olive oil so much? Because it is rich in monounsaturated fat, as well as other polyphenols and antioxidants. So olive oil is pretty good. Uh, other rich monounsaturated mono fat rich foods include canola oil, which is not in the same family at all. Canola oil is from the same family as mustard and broccoli and cabbage. And uh, people make a big, get quite fussy about canola oil saying, it originally came out as a, a lubricant for motor oil, motors and, and movable parts. I think you can use anything on a motor if you have you run out. So it's actually, canola is based on the word Canada, C-A-N, O for oil, and the O-L-A, the L-A part, I'm not sure, but during the 1970s, if you know this story, raise your hand, I don't want to bore you. During the 1970s, the throne of international oil trade was corn and soybean. And the canola oil, or what was then called rapeseed oil, is a cold hardy plant. So it was grown mostly in Canada, but some parts of like um, Wyoming and North Dakota, which as a person from New York, to me, it's all like way over there and cold and not very dense. So with the popularity and the promotion and the, the federal support for the growing and harvesting of soybean oil and corn oil, the number of sales of, of gallons of canola oil was, or rather rapeseed oil was diminishing. And therefore the number of acres of rapeseed plants were diminishing. And I remember reading a number, which I have no way to prove this right, but down to 800 acres from what had been thousands. But the problem with rapeseed oil was that it contained one fatty acid that might have been associated with cancer. So if you and I, let's say Barbara and I were had acres and acres of rape, rapeseed oil, we'd have to send it to a refiner to remove that fatty acid, and then we could bring it back to the market as lower rustic acid rapeseed oil. But selectively breeding the plant so that you could come up with a seed, which when pressed, had an undetectable amount of erucic acid, now you can have something which doesn't have to be refined. It's also very rich in monounsaturated fat. And who did this selective breeding? The Canadian oil growers. 
and therefore it's called canola. And it used to be with a capital C because it was not a it was a proprietary thing, but now it is in the open codex market and it's a little C. And the seeds are grown in uh, Wyoming and North Dakota and all those other way out of the way places that, again, as a New Yorker, <laughs> they seem, seem far off. Yes. Oh, so the product was called rape seed oil. I don't know where that word came from. Oh, I always great. mean to look it up because it doesn't I give you a say, warm fuzzy. No, not great. Grape seed oil is very similar profile to corn oil. Doesn't make it bad or good. It just makes it a similar profile with a polyunsaturated to saturated to monounsaturated fat. Okay, so olive oil, good stuff. <clears throat> the um, in the nineteen uh, late nineteen nineties, early two thousands maybe there was a expose of some olive oil importers had used non-olive oil or maybe 10% olive oil and some other oil with a green tint yeah. to it to basically cheat the international market. I do not know what companies they were or, and I know that these are very rigorously um, examined and tested when they enter, you know, as they're part of the international trade. And I, if you are all about USA, USA, you know, California olive oil is said to be very good too. I'll be honest with you, uh, since I don't have a taste for quality, I just buy whatever's on the shelf at either Stop and Shop or Target. But if anyone here would like to teach me how to really appreciate good olive oil, I'm all ears and share it with the rest of us. So what's another ingredient today? Onion. Um, the onion is a flavor cornerstone for every cuisine in the world. Has anyone ever known anyone that didn't use an onion sooner or later? Okay, so we've, um, my mom, speaking of comfort, used to make cough syrup by chopping onions and putting sugar on it. And of course that would draw out liquid. I've never done it as an adult and I didn't put for my kids. But you guys know I'm famous for coughing. I'll have to try it. <laughs> um, it seemed like it worked. So some of the differences in onions has to do with, again, the Pressures of selection as these products grow across the globe to have different colors, to have different intensities. Um, but mostly they're they're quite oniony and there's no getting around it. You you can't sneak an onion into a room, like you can't sneak a boiled egg into a room. We have said that onions are sustainable in a way that you probably can regrow an onion by sticking it back in the dirt if you happen to have pots or some a raised bed or something. You can use the onion greens for things. So there's lots more one can do other than just the onion. So what's another ingredient today? Garlic. And there are some interesting points in here about garlic called the, the stinking rose, but also having demonstrated value as an uh, antibiotic, similar to the pepper. Uh, I can recall lots of well-supported complementary medicine uh, workshops describing if you have an ear, ear ache, ear infection, put a crush of garlic clove and tuck it in your ear. Um, I, th I think I'm going to go to urgent care <laughs> with the garlic in my ear, <laughs> just in case it's a long wait. You know? All right, so... Tamika, come on back and I'll pick up some more color commentator stuff when you after you have the train. Yep. No, you are you're hot. Okay. <laughs> So the second part of our deck is going to be the cucumbers and salad. So that just consists of slice cucumber, then we slice onion, some red wine vinegar, salt, sugar. It was still but now. Okay, so what we're going to do is we have our cucumbers here, put them in the bowl. 
They can be seedless, they can be with seeds. I prefer seedless. That your favorite variety of cucumber. The seedless. Why why seedless? I think they're sweeter. sweeter. Okay, we have our thinly spiced onion. I put I prefer red. I use red red. I don't prefer the yellow ones anyway. Because I, I like the color. They have colors here in the dish. And they're milder. And I always soak mine before I use them. It gets some of the onion smell and taste out of the dish. Yeah, I do that. I'm probably Cold ice water with a little salt. Okay, that's the salt. Yep. So that's what I do. Okay. 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 If you like salt, then you want the pepper, you can add it as well. And the sugar is five tablespoons of sugar for this recipe. But it's again up to you. Your preference, if you like less sugar, you put less sugar. And how many people will this recipe serve? The, what you're doing right here? This recipe is going to be 16 servings. Six okay, so if you were doing it for yourself. You're talking maybe a quarter of a teaspoon of sugar. Yes, it was something one like that. It's all the same thing. You just put a dash of salt. Yes. So okay, so cutting it back down. If you have your questions on how to scale it back, that's good. Okay, hey, you know what? How would you? Uh, is there a formula for cutting back? Yeah, we would just divide whatever you're going to make. Mine is like two or four. Or if you want to add it up, oh, you just add more to the to the. Um, and by the way, if anybody, because I do sometimes, <coughs> a lot of recipes now you can put in how many one, two, three, four, and it will automatically scale it up or down. That's so true. Which is really a nice feature now on a lot of websites. Yeah. Okay, so next I'm adding the, a cup of red wine vinegar. That's going to give it the acidity as well as like the little spicy taste. You can just mix it up. Cucumber salad. So, in a few minutes, we are going to be able to taste all of this delicious. What's coming out of the oven as we speak? So, so Mardine, in the meantime, you want to take over? Yep. And um, this tag team. <laughs> I like this. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Always hot, but not hot. Um, we're having trouble hearing at home. Uh, what did she just do? We don't. I don't know what she just did. What did she make right now? Her last demonstration was the cucumber salad. And she used uh, some pre sliced uh, purple onions. She used salt. Of course, cucumbers. Sugar. Sugar. And red wine vinegar. Red wine vinegar. And I will be sharing the recipes. Yeah. So I thought I'd talk a second about salt. Um, Nothing to do with uh, good luck throwing it over your shoulder. But how many different kinds of salt does, every, does anyone have? Let's see if we can find the most salt varieties on one kitchen shelf. I have one. You already know my shopping is simple. And if it says Target or it says Stop and Shop, I'm good to go. I have culture and I have just regular uh, more type salt. Okay. I have different ones because my daughter got a gift with different, like small okay. salt to this, that, the other. It's yeah. <laughs> so she says, I certainly will, but thank you for reminding me. So standard salt, according to Mark Bittman, who um, I in the, in the group before, I've never met him, but I love his writing and, and his uh, commentary about things to do with food. <clears throat> Kosher salt 
is simply a larger kernel. And when people make corned beef, they're using corn salt or big chunks of salt. It isn't really kosher by a religious standard. There's no rabbi that is blessing it, but it is used in the koshering of meats. So it gets to be called kosher salt. But it's a standardized salt, very similar to what we use in the house as Morton's or otherwise. And you can get salt with extra iodine added or not iodized. But now we're learning that there are pink salts, Himalayan salts, smoked salts, and they seem to be um, a, a very useful thing to have in your on your shelf to kind of enhance your food. So once I have one, I'm admitting I have one kind of salt on the, in the house. You have two, but your two salts, which are kosher salt right. and a Morton type salt, are probably the same thing. Sodium chloride, one is a bigger chunk. By the way, that bigger chunk means when you measure it, let's say a teaspoon, you're actually not getting as much salt as you would if it was a finely granulated or finely um, ground salt. So you have to think of adjusting your volume of salt by whether it's chunky one, because there's more air pockets in between those little chunks and standard. Um, whenever I'm watching cooking shows, the chefs are always talking about it and then put in a pinch of kosher salt. So you have a little more control with a pinch of kosher salt because you can actually grab it. But I, I think my daughter, when she moved in with us, Mom, I just need a few months to save some money. Uh, Two years ago. Okay, so <laughs> um, she brought kosher salt, and I was like, what am I going to, you know, let's try. It doesn't do popcorn. Don't, don't bother. <laughs> Stay with the fine stuff. Now, your daughter received a gift that had a variety of different salts, and those looked like pretty pretty interesting things to, to give someone that's very thoughtful. And maybe you have about four varieties of salt then? Okay, who's got more, more salt varieties? Also, the, my son buys the sea salt paracure universitaria. And what's the difference between the, like you say, mortals or the sea yeah. salt? What's the so sea salt means that water from the sea has been evaporated and the, when it, the evaporated water leaves behind this sandy bit, that's the salt. It has other minerals besides sodium and chloride. It may have magnesium, it may have a small amount of calcium. It isn't nutritionally that significant, but it may taste, affect the flavor slightly and the price a lot. Who else has some other salts in the house? Yes, I have fruits. I have uh, garlic salt and onion salt. Okay, so now. Those are a garlic powder and onion powder with salt added. So even though I have them as well on my shelf, the, the cost is really, you're paying a lot more for the salt content and you're getting less, you're getting this nice combo. So if you're an efficient cook, it makes it one, two, three shakes and you're done as opposed to find some garlic powder, find some salt and kind of try to blend them well. Question? Okay. Okay, so we can move on a bit away oh, from Can you hear me? Question in the uh, online. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Okay, so I was I was recently was introduced to something called black salt that has a high uh, uh, sulfur and actually tastes like eggs. Very interesting. So she's telling us that she was introduced to black salt, which has a high sulfur content. And tastes a little bit like eggs. She finds it very interesting. I was, I was looking for a recipe to make shakshuka with tofu. And so it, at the end, you add that salt and it tastes like you're eating eggs. Does anyone know shakshuka? Um, I was introduced to shakshuka relatively recently. Then I find out that thousands of people know about it. Um, if you would tell us about this, I mean, I know what it is now, but I'd like for you to tell us the ingredients of shakshuka. You're going to have to repeat it. So and I'll repeat it. Yeah. Oh, the, the ingredients of you make a sauce with uh, with uh, uh, onions and garlic and uh, with a little cayenne pepper, uh, uh, what do you call it? A tomato sauce. And, and I also do diced, diced tomatoes and peppers. I saute so it's like a 
it's like a nice chunky sauce of tomatoes and onions and uh, peppers. And so it's kind of a, a good marinara got together with a <laughs> with eggs with yeah with a can of diced tomatoes so you, you cook it down and then you kind of make little holes of it and break yes. it and stick it to it so you cook that down and you make little you little uh, divots and you put your egg in there and then the eggs cook right. so they, it's, you can cheat you can cheat and use a bottle of salsa <laughs> i love the sound of that she says cheat use a bottle of salsa if, you know, if you're a cook, you've Absolutely. got a life. You want to do something other than stand at the stove for two hours. Good idea. Good so, idea. But she was saying that she used the tofu with the sulfur salt, the black salt, and it tasted like eggs. Let me repeat what Barbara just said. So the egg is obviously not vegan. To be, to be fair, I did not I did not try that recipe yet. It just happened. I just was researching it last week, so I went to buy the black salt. So I did. I cannot give you a review on that book, but I did taste the salt, and it tasted like it. So it's a very sulfury salt, which sounds a little unpleasant at the beginning, but I think it's got the potential to be very uh, complementary to a lot of foods. She's going to try the recipe soon. And next time we have an online uh, chat, you're going to give us the uh, 411 on that. Um, the black salt will possibly give it an eggy effect if you don't use egg, but instead you use tofu. So that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let me move on from salt. I think um, Tamika is returning. And she'll be back in a little. Yeah, she, she's getting food. When you're done, we'll come back and get the taste. Okay, so go ahead and finish what you're doing. Okay, so everyone has the handouts if you want to kind of flip around with me. Black pepper. Um, actually, I had a picture of black pepper that I was going to think. And I said, oh, but I'm not doing a PowerPoint. So let's just go ahead with the text. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, native to parts of Indonesia and India, India, very tropical. It's said to be the most... Um, in the, in the flavoring and herb, not necessarily herb, but seasoning world, it's the most sold and traded seasoning in the world, black pepper. Who the thunk, right? Um, and the difference between the black pepper and the white pepper has to do with the place on the, on the seed that you grind. Dried cooked peppercorns have been in, since antiquity. I'm looking at the bottom of page nine for both its flavor and as a traditional medicine. I had an occasion where um, a student who was from India made like a chai tea and put a lot of black pepper in it. And it was a surprise. I wasn't keen on it, but it, it was a nice mouth experience. Has anyone ever thought of putting black pepper in their chai tea? There you go. Well, remember, so many of these food ingredients um, I, went, I think I have to go back to parsley. <laughs> do have medicinal characteristics. And when you have a blend of them in your, your various staples, it's giving, it's imparting to you a lot of health protection. An important thing I know I've talked about before in some of my other presentations is the anti-inflammatory score that has been given to different foods. And tomatoes have the highest anti-inflammatory score of any other food. Amazing. So that one, dark tomato? All, canned tomatoes, tomato sauce, tomato paste. And the explanation as to what gives it this anti-inflammatory score, such a high one, um, is a combination of things, beta carotene, vitamin C, and um, lots of other things that are just intrinsic to a tomato. Almost to the point where you should think, we should be eating a tomato every day, maybe? A part of a tomato? Okay, ketchup. All right, fine. Just Wait. put it in your mouth, okay. Can I ask a question? What's the difference between black pepper and white pepper? So I, I'm gonna go blah, 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 for a moment. Uh, the difference between black pepper and white pepper. So we do have a handout, which I you know, read out, can't put in front of you. And the description is given here. Um, they're ground 
before them is simply as pepper or more precisely black pepper. Cooked and dried unripe fruit, green pepper is dried unripe fruit, and white pepper is dried ripe fruit. So it's the same pepper seed dried at a different stage of ripeness, and the white pepper is the most ripe. So if I think about it, any fruit that is least ripe is usually a tiny bit more harsh than the very ripened fruit, right? So it's, and pepper is a seed coming from a flowering plant. So the more ripe, the more mild, and even many culinary people say fruity flavor that you get from white pepper. The only time I've ever used white pepper, excuse me, was making a gingerbread. So the white pepper is sitting on the shelf where the cinnamon and the nutmeg are. But the black pepper is sitting over here where the garlic powder and the onion powder are, because that's like, that's for cooking. And the other one's for baking. I have never put one in the palm of my hand and then just taste it. But by the way, the handout, which is a combination of um, articles that I pasted in or edited in from either Wikipedia or Bon Appetit online, or this site that is about seasonalfruit.com. Um, I will not take credit for having, except maybe the canola story, um, a lot of personal experience with all of that research. So celery, which is in the stuffed pepper, <clears throat> is in the same family as probably most of you know as carrot and parsley and celeriac. And wild carrot would be called Queen Anne's lace. Has anyone ever been wandering around a park and you see that the wild carrot, when it's in flower, it has sort of an umbrella shape and it's little white flowers? Maybe? Yes. yes. So it gets to be called Queen Anne's lace because of the flower, the, the configuration of the flowers. And it's called bird's nest because when the flowers are dried and a seed pod forms, the umbrella shape kind of inverts and becomes this, this uh, brown, hard, nesty looking thing. And there are other plants that are in the same family. There's something called giant hogweed. Anybody know that one? It's a native, it's a cousin of carrot and celery and parsley. It grows taller than me. If you hack it, and I mean hack, it has a hollow stem and it exudes a liquid which will burn your skin. It is said that this is again me finding lots of trivia amongst the food history people that if you wanted to brand a cow, you could do it with the hogweed uh, liquid. And if you had, let's imagine we all own some property somewhere in the woods and we had hogweed growing and we wanted to get rid of it, you really have to wrap yourself in all kinds of protection from the sun because if the hogweed liquid gets on your skin and exposed to ultraviolet light, it does have uh, a negative consequence, skin burns. Uh, emergency room visit will be in your future. <laughs> But we can find lots of these same plants and their cousins growing wild. I'm sure if we just went probably no more than 10 feet from the front door. Okay, let's talk about some more food. Oh, Tamika, the chef is arriving. Yes, whenever. I can put a fresh pause any old time. Questions online, anyone? Comments? Okay. Thank you, Wanda. Okay, guys, so now is the time. This is the time we've been waiting for to taste what we just do. So, Kevin's going around handing out the tasting plates, and I'm going to give you a quick little story about one time I never made this when I was a younger. So, I had a big test. I was in sixth grade, and I had a big math test. And I was studying, and I kept not answering the questions right, and I was crying. I was going to go to school, and I'm going to go to school for the bell test. And she said to me, go. Look at me. You're going to go to school. You're going to take that test. 
And when you come home, you're going to have your pepper. It's going to be okay. So now what I'm thinking about is that pepper that I'm going to have when I come home after I pass the test. So long story short, I went to school. I passed my test with 100, and I got 100. 100. And <laughs> by then I had my pepper waiting for me. <laughs> and ever since then, that's my go-to when I have a problem. I got to make me a pepper. So, um, so let's taste. Um, let me show you guys what it looks like when it first comes out the oven. Give me one second. I have a whole room. So you guys also know peppers are in the, what's called the nightshade family. There's also some cool nightshade that I'm sure we can run around outside and go find them. Well, European nightshade, not supposed to chew on them, but I don't have a problem with eating peppers or tomatoes or eggplant and potato, uh, as in white potato variety. But some people do report that they feel a little more tenderness in their joints. Uh, so the, the complementary medicine world says the nightshade vegetable that is fully ripened on the vine is likely to not give you that kind of discomfort. Whereas if you buy like hothouse tomatoes or something that wasn't fully ripened, it might. I am not saying that with a definitive, you know, um, honesty, but if you know anyone who does have a, or feels they may have a problem, try to get them to eat fully ripened because it's such good food. Thank you, once again. Okay, so this is what the pepper will look like when you take it out of the oven. Okay. We have it spotlighted there, so everybody can see. <laughs> I can, I can, I can, I can. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, what do you think so far? Good. Hold on, let me uh, spotlight that for as soon as I can find it. Hold on, I think this is it. Come on. Nope, wrong one. <laughs> Hold on. All right, next one. It's hard and to believe, guys. My man has passed away about more well, than 30 so many years ago. So uh, this is one thing that sticks with me. It keeps me alive with her. Yeah. So. One of the first things you learned how to cook. There we go. Her name was Cassandra. That's Cassandra Adams. So I'm passing on her recipe. I wish you were here because she was so proud. So I thank you for allowing me to tell you this. And I hope you all enjoyed it. I want you to hold up your, your recipe. I want to take a picture of the temperature. Dan, no. Oh, folks, hold on a second. For some reason, I have this a video. Photo. Literally. All right. And I can see you together. I want to thank one thing for coming and explaining all the work. That's <laughs> and, and you do a brilliant job of that. Thank you guys so much. So what is it? Yes, and well, that's what I use it for. So you know, have a problem, your pepper, it's going to be okay. <laughs> yes, it helps me get through the day. This would be a good picnic food. It's portable. It is portable, but it needs to be hot. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. And like I said, you can use red peppers, green peppers, yellow peppers, orange peppers. And also, if you prefer, you can actually cut it from the top and stuff it inside and put the cat back. Very efficient. Does it the same exact same thing? So, like when you put the cat one, it's like a little pot on the top. <laughs> but Nana did it this way for us so we could see all the because we were chosen and she wanted to see the 
you know. Did she, did she make the ground beef? The ground beef? She used ground beef. I used ground turkey. I both have done it with chicken, I've done it with sausage. So it just all depends on what you taste for the filling for that. So do I have any questions? I have a silly question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh. Well, Let's imagine you spent time cooking this and then you had guests in the table and somebody went right, right for the jar of hot sauce. That's fine. Really? That's oh, fine. No. If you like your food hotter than I made it, it's good. It's not gonna. It's gonna just make the food. That's right. <laughs> as long as it's not ketchup. Yeah, I never had that problem. Learned that me too. Unless it's fried chicken. Doesn't put out. It went good with the salad. It went good with the salad, right? This is something new. And it gives it an extra so I'm gonna do it from now on. Yay! Do you have any questions? Any any help? Let me know. So guys, once again, I want to thank you for coming. Yes, I may do many more so that you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I have food. Uh, Andrew doesn't eat meat, but I'm just want some salad. Yeah, you can put anything in if you want. And just to let you know, these guys are going to be teaming up again. Yes. In a couple months. Yes. Um, this time, next time, Mo Team will be doing the cooking. And Tamika's going to be teaching not about knives and knife skills. So they're going to get a little just having to use a knife. You get to try out your little mini, little mini skills. So that's going to be perfect. Meals for one. So we've got it all. Yeah. What are we going to see this going? So he wants me to ask the menu. Very good. Really good. Thank you. for some time in the near future. Okay. So next month we're going to have all Dean, and you're going to be going to help them buy lunch, snack, breakfast, and dessert. So uh, we can uh, take a little bit of something you might have always done, and she is going to uh, show you how to make it healthy and still taste good. So uh, you don't want to miss it. That's going to be August 25th. I mean, the, the last Friday in August. Yeah. And Barbara came up with Barbara came up with the phrase "Hot Sauce Healthify." So I want to lie and see if anyone using the word healthify. It's all over the place, but it's Barbara's vision. Yes, of course. Of course. I'm, I'm branding it. That's what I'm claiming. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. That's it. <laughs> all right. Enjoy. And thank you, everybody online. We appreciate you coming. And uh, hope to see you next time in house. And uh, we'll see you in August. And take care. Thank you. The one thing I wanted to mention when you guys are talking about olive oil, uh, just for safety, to try and buy a smaller bottle and keep it in the dark so it doesn't go rancid because it does go rancid quickly. But thanks so much for including us. We really appreciate it. There's an excellent comment online uh, with olive oil. This is actually true. And she was talking about how it goes rancid, small bottles to keep it right. rancid. And you are so your your vegetable your cooking oils are either very high in polyunsaturated like corn oil, soybean oil, or very high in monounsaturated like olive oil and canola. And the, either of them should be kept in the dark and cool. I keep all of mine in the refrigerator. They fit. So you can also just buy smaller bottles so that you don't have it going rancid or standing on your counter as long. Thank you online. They should be kept dark. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Should be kept dark. Cool.
Oh, pardon me. So we know if you put olive oil in the refrigerator, it gets cloudy. It's okay. All you have to do is bring it out 15 minutes, it's ready again. If you've kept your olive oil on the shelf for the last 40 years and you're here to tell about it, obviously it's not harmful, but it's the, uh, the unsaturated bonds are more likely to break and cause sort of a stickiness and a change in flavor when it is altered by heat or ultraviolet light. So cool and dark. And thank you online. Is that why the bottle? Because I'm not a cook and my husband was. So he would buy the gallon and have to grab it from Italy. The first, uh, what is it? The first, first, uh, first pressing. And that comes in a can dark. And then he would keep it in the dark bottle. My suggest. son does the same thing when he comes. He gives me all a lot. <laughs> he brings the oil, not that I cook, but then. Yeah, but that's interesting. That's some super soap also. So if you have olive oil that you say, I haven't cooked with this in about two years, find somebody who makes soap. They'll be happy to get it. Okay. Who made soap with us? Soap, yeah. And it's and good oil. for your skin. Yeah. It's good. It's good for moisturizing. You know, olive oil is kind of kinky in the stories about like the, the um, what's the word I should use for it? Roman times. <laughs> the debauchery. They didn't shower or wash, but they poured olive oil on their skin. Then they wiped it off with like a something flat, like a credit card. <laughs> and that was the way to clean the body. <laughs> Makes so. Probably, oh, probably still better than the Middle Ages. Okay, we're getting some good questions. Anybody else? We got time. I got, I'm, I'm not letting Martine go until we're done. Could you pass me water? I think there's another. Oh. Anybody else? Okay, I think now we're officially done. We're officially done. Thank you so much. I take care. And it's not it was sure nice having Maudine and, and Tamika together. What a great combo. The yeah, it was, it, and, it and, was good. Uh, embellisher, thank you so much for including us on the line. I really appreciate it, Barbara. Take care. Right, thank you, Barbara. Can I get that recipe when I come to the center? Yes, I have extra recipes. Okay, I'll see you then. All right. Okay, thanks. sounds good. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.